Let's begin. Genesis chapter 31, and we left off at verse 43. If you recall, Laban, he insists uh, to Jacob, after Jacob said that these belong to me, Laban's insisting back, no, they belong to me. In verse 43, And Laban answered and said unto Jacob, These daughters are my daughters, and these children are my children, and these cattle are my cattle, and all that thou seest is mine. And what can I do this day? Unto these my daughters are unto their children, which they have borne. Now Laban, he answers and says to Jacob that these daughters are mine. So he's obviously referring to Jacob's wives. And Laban also says that Jacob's children belong to him as well. So you can see he's a very selfless person. Uh, he also says that these cattle are my cattle. Uh, well, you know, that's debatable. <laughs> it's a battle of wits, you might recall. And Jacob won and got the cattle for his own gain. And Laban, he's probably thinking that Jacob got it through deceptive means, which is very true. And Laban says, everything that you see belongs to me. And then he gives this, oh, look at this, a victim card. You know, I keep trying to tell you many times in the past Genesis study, you can see how these two men are so self-centered, they pulled the victim card, and they're not much different from the liberal community that you see today. So he's saying that all of them are mine, and then he gives this uh, whining statement at the last part of verse 43. I mean, what can I do this day? What can I do with uh, my daughters and the children that they've born? I can't do anything about it. I have to let them go. Why does Laban know that? Because remember, God approached to Laban in a dream, and then he told him not to do anything bad to Jacob. Because of that, J uh, Laban can't threaten uh, Jacob, say those bad things to Jacob, and take uh, his daughters and Jacob's children for himself. He's trapped. Verse 44, Now therefore come thou, let us make a covenant, I and thou, and let it be for a witness between me and thee. So Laban says, there's nothing I can do about it, so let's do this. Let's make a deal. Let's make a covenant between uh, you and me. And let this covenant be visible and be a standing evidence witness between you and me. If you recall, uh, or if you know, back then they obviously didn't have documents as proof for testimony, for witness. So they have to use some kind of visible object. Verse 45, And Jacob took a stone and set it up for a pillar. And Jacob said unto his brethren, Gather stones. And they took stones and made an heap. And they did eat there upon the heap. So the visible witness is where Jacob takes a stone and he sets it up for a pillar. So it must have been a very big stone that Jacob used for a pillar. Then he tells his uh, people to gather up other stones and then they piled it uh, upon this uh, big stone that was a pillar. So then it became a huge heap and then they uh, ate where that heap was, of stones was located. Laban, at verse 47, and Laban called it Jagar Sahadutha, but Jacob called it Galid. So both of the meanings, Laban, he calls it a Chaldean word, and Jacob, he calls it by a Hebrew word. And the definition is in verse 48, and Laban said, this heap is a witness between me and thee this day. Therefore was the name of it called Galid. So Laban says that this heap of stones will be that witness that's visible between me and you this day. We're going to remember this day. And that's why that heap is called Galid. If it's called heap of witness, Laban says, and the Bible says in verse 48, that's why it's called Galid. That's why we know the definition then. So the definition is heap of witness uh, in the in child, according to the Chaldaic uh, name, Jegar Sahadutha, it will be heap of witness, and then Hebrew will be Galid. And Mizpah, for he said, the Lord watch between me and thee when we are absent one from another. So Laban, he gives it additional name. He says it's also Mizpah. Why? 
because the Lord will watch between me and you whenever uh, we're absent from each other. We don't keep an eye on each other. Why does he insist that the Lord watches between me and him? Uh, excuse me, uh, me and thee, he says. Verse 50, if thou shalt afflict my daughters, or if thou shalt take other wives beside my daughters, no man is with us. See, God is witness betwixt me and thee. So Laban, out of concern for his daughters, he wants the heap of stones to also not just be a witness, but that God will be his watcher. That if Jacob uh, afflicts or mistreats his daughters, or if he takes other women besides his own daughters, hey, no man is with us, right? They're both absent. So Laban can't go over there and cross over to the other side and threaten Jacob because he already was told by God in a dream not to, uh, not to do that. Hands off of Jacob. So Laban says, I can't do anything about it, but this heap of stones will be a witness. Say, you don't do that to my daughters. See, God is witness between, betwixt me and thee. So Laban's leaving it up to God. God will be the witness between me and you. He'll handle you when you mess up. And Laban said to Jacob, Behold this heap and behold this pillar which I have cast betwixt me and thee. So Laban says to J Jacob, Hey, okay, behold. So here it is, this heap. Pay attention to this. Behold this pillar as well, not just the heap of stones and this pillar that I have uh, thrown, that I have put down between me and you. Verse 52, this heap be witness and this pillar be witness that I will not pass over this heap to thee and that thou shall not pass over this heap and this pillar unto me for harm. Laban, he says, let this heap be a witness and the pillar, so showing that heap of stones and pillar. It seemed to support my explanation at verse 45 and 46. It says, started out with a big stone, which is a pillar, and then a heap of stones that were piled on top of that. Okay, so that's why there are two things that Laban mentions here. Or it seems to be that way. Continuing on, he says that uh, the pillar and the heap of stones are going to be that visible witness that I'm not going to pass over this heap of stones to you and you're not going to do the same with me uh, for harm. We're going to have hands off against each other. You're going to stay on your boundaries. I'll stay in mine. Now, if uh, we look at verse 43 through 53, we can see that uh, the United Nations have violated this passage. The United Nations and then... Uh, we can see that Laban's ancestry, which is the Syrian nations, and then also the Jewish nations, we can see that they didn't really care about this heap of stones. <laughs> it's probably not there anymore. But this is a, a biblical witness from their first ancestors. They made this promise. The promise was two things. One, you stay within your territory, I stay in mine. Well, then why do you have to divide up the land of Israel even more then? This is all the way at the beginning. So this was a biblical covenant that was made, but they violated it. They didn't really too much care about it. So you have to stay in your territory. I will stay in mine. Number two, that we won't harm each other. <laughs> okay, fine job they're doing, right? <laughs> Is this part cut off? No. Okay. So the covenant is made between Laban and Jacob. Laban, remember, he's from that Syrian region, Syrian ancestry. And then also uh, Jacob, he is obviously the father of the Jewish people. So this covenant between Laban and Jacob is not really followed. <laughs> And there were several things within it. As I mentioned before, boundary line, stay in your territory. Number two, no harm. Well, they're still at war. <laughs> They'll never gain peace. 
As a matter of fact, the Bible already knew that and prophesied it. So God has to set things straight when he comes down. Three, I found this part interesting for number three. He mentions here that, uh, let's see here, is it verse, not 52, uh, he mentions at verse 50, if thou shalt afflict, take otherwise, uh, God is witness between, twixt me and thee. Oh, I lost that, uh, I lost it. Uh, there was a gold mine that I found over here. Anyways, so in verse 49, he says that uh, the Lord will be the uh, watcher between us when we are absent from each other, when we don't keep an eye on each other. And that uh, verse 50, you're not supposed to mistreat my daughters and uh, no man is with us, but God will be the witness between me and you. So God will deal with you. God will take care of you. Verse 50 it seems like uh, the Syrians are, or the ancestry that came from Laban are not doing a good job. Laban is not supposed to uh, do anything with Jacob. Nothing bad. He's supposed to let God handle him. So number three, let God handle the Jews. Now, surprisingly, a bunch of Gentile Christians are the ones that are keeping that one covenant, not the others. So a lot of people will get upset about Israeli politics or, you know, when they get into conspiracies about some of the things that Jewish elites do, or you can go on and on and on and on. And I know there's a good number of Jewish liberal atheists who can be meaner than other atheists. There are Jews like that. But the thing is this, you have to understand that they are God's chosen people. That is God's nation. And there was a covenant made. If you're upset about it, you got to leave it up to the Lord. Right. Let God handle the Jewish people. If you know their history, God pretty much handled them. And he's not done handling them. Wait till you see the tribulation. It'll be much worse. It's, uh, that's why uh, it's called the wrath of God, the tribulation, yep. that time. So the Jews are going to have to go through that. The Christian mindset is to leave God's people alone, the Jews. But there are some Christians deceived by wrong doctrine. They don't get that. And they think that the Jews are our enemies, public enemy number one, and they control all the world. You know, uh, you don't read your Bible. You're not really a Christian, I guess. All right, go to Genesis 31. Genesis chapter 31. So these are three important things between the covenant of uh, Laban and Jacob. That should be followed, and there was a heap of witness, but that heap of witness, they could care less, man. They could care less. If we look at verse 53, Laban says, The God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge betwixt us. So Laban, he swears by Abraham's God and Nahor's God the God of both Abraham and Nahor's father. Let that God judge between us. The reason why Laban talks that way is because he's not referring to a Israel, uh, the Jewish God. He's trying to focus on his ancestry, the Syrian part. So his ancestry would go back, uh, he can go back to Abraham, to Nahor, which is the God of their father, Terah. So if we go back to Genesis 11, Genesis 11. Genesis chapter 11. If Abraham's God is the same thing as Terah's God, then we can see here that Terah, he must have been a saved individual then. He must have been a saved individual, Terah, Abraham's father. We'll go to Genesis chapter 11, and then uh, we'll read verse 26. And Terah lived 70 years and begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. So notice here that Nahor and Abram, their father is Terah. So Laban is swearing by Terah's God, or even Abraham's God, which has got to be the right God. Then Nahor and Terah should have been God-fearing people. But isn't it funny that Laban is an incredible example 
uh, re recognizing the true God, but he'll still keep his idols? Isn't that a strange thing? Weird thing. Weird. All right, let's go to Genesis chapter 31, and then we'll read verse 53, the second half of verse 53. And Jacob swear by uh, the fear of his father Isaac. So while Laban says that the God of his father will judge between him and Jacob, Jacob swears by the fear of his father Isaac. Uh, it's, it's pretty interesting how he swears by the fear of his father Isaac. It's like probably... Jacob was emphasizing the Jewish God because of his father Isaac, which is obviously not the same as Laban, because Isaac is from a different family from Laban. Another thing is, he says, the fear of his father Isaac, meaning that Laban, it would do good to remind you, you should be afraid, okay? So keep your oath. He could, also be, he could also be referring to, let, let's both have this fear and be careful when we swear. So we see in Genesis chapter 31, and then we looked at verse 53. In verse 53, they both swear by the God of their ancestry. We're going to look at verse 54. Then Jacob offered sacrifice upon the mount and called his brethren to eat bread. And they did eat bread and tarried all night in the mount. So Jacob, he offered uh, sacrifices on that mount because it's supposed to be a uh, sacred. It's supposed to be a very solemn witness covenant that they made. But uh, their children or their... <laughs> Their families after them, their generations after them, really didn't care about that. Jacob, he uh, called his own people to eat bread, so to have a feast together. And they all had a feast together, and then they uh, stayed all night at that mount together. Verse 55, and early in the morning, Laban rose up and kissed Jacob, and then his sons and his daughters, and blessed them. Did I read that right? I didn't, right? So hopefully you're paying attention, <laughs> okay? You're not, you're not asleep, right? Okay? Remember I said we're going to go word for word. I meant that. <laughs> so early in the morning, uh, Laban, he got up, and then uh, he's going to say bye. So he bypasses Jacob. So then he kisses the children, which is referring to his sons and daughters, and that's also referring to uh, Rachel and Leah. Now how we know this is because of the context, again, when we go back a couple verses behind. So let's go a couple verses behind in Genesis chapter 31. And then we'll look at verse uh, 26. If you look at right here, he says, uh, Laban, he complains to Jacob, uh, why would you took away my daughters like they're slaves? And he's obviously referring to Rachel and Leah. But then he says in verse 28, you, Jacob meaning that he should be distinguished. You, Jacob, didn't allow me to kiss my sons and my daughters. So Jacob is not included in this list. So when Laban says sons and daughters, then he's referring to Rachel, Leah, and to his grandchildren. We pretty much know that. We're going to go back to the main passage. It's it's also, uh, I'll mention verse 43 as well. You can see that phrase, these daughters are my daughters, these children are my children, Laban says. So that seems to match up with uh, what Laban was referring to the context before about his sons and daughters and kissing them. So he doesn't uh, kiss Jacob goodbye, so there's bad blood between them. Then he blesses uh, his daughters and then the grandchildren and then Laban leaves and then goes back to his own place. All right, and they all lived happily ever after up to this day, right? All right. Genesis chapter 32, Genesis chapter 32. That bad blood always carried, 
It always carried up to this day. And it will carry into the tribulation. God promised that it's not going to be resolved. You know, it's funny that United Nations, they think they can resolve it. It'll never be resolved, no matter how hard you try. Yeah. Never. You got to wait for the King of Kings to come down. Amen. Set everything straight. All right, Genesis chapter 32 and verse 1. And Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's host. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim. Now, uh, Jacob, as he continues on his journey, there were angels uh, of God that met him along the way. Now, Jacob, he sees them. And then he s says that this is God's host or his army. So that's why he calls the name of that location that he happened to pass by where those armies of angels met him, Mahanaim. Mahanaim, it means two armed camps, two armies. That's what it means. Now, there's something important that we can notice here. I want you to go to the book of 2 Kings, 2 Kings. Jacob is known to have seen this band of angels, not his people, not his wives, not his children. Did you notice that? It only mentions Jacob. Now, why is that? Because, remember, what is Jacob's role? He's a prophet. Prophets are able to see spirit on a spiritual plane that other people can't. Because he's able to do that, that's why in this particular passage, Elisha was able to see the army of angels, but the other people weren't. All right, let's go to the book of 2 Kings, and then we'll go to chapter 7. Yep, we'll go to chapter 7. Or chapter, let's see right here, I think it's chapter 6, excuse me, chapter 6. And then we'll read verse 15. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And the servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? This is how Elisha the prophet responds. Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. So Elisha is saying, Look, uh, the, one, the army that's with us are more than those Syrians. But the guy didn't see that. So Elisha prays that God will open his eyes in verse 17. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. So uh, he sees that spiritual plane. Uh, Elisha, the prophet, saw that army. But, the, but his servant didn't. All right, go to Genesis 32. Now, this is some prophet, Jacob. This is some prophet. You talk about one of the worst examples of a prophet in the Bible, you get Jacob right here. You get Jacob. Because you're going to see how he takes care of it when we continue reading on. Verse 3, And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, unto the land of Seir, the country of Edom. So Jacob, he's arriving home. As he's arriving home, he's obviously getting more scared. And as he's getting more scared, he's sending messengers at the land of Seir, where his brother Esau is located. When he sends over that messenger to greet Esau, notice that Jacob, he was full of faith in the Lord, and then he relied completely on prayer. And then uh, seeing his power and role as a prophet, he knows that God's hand and protection is on him. And then, no, that's not what happened. All right. <laughs> Go to Genesis 32 and keep reading onward. In the country of Edom, the land of Seir, where his brother is located, verse 4, and he commanded them, saying, Thus shall he speak unto my lord Esau, thy servant Jacob, saith thus, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed there until now. Jacob, he doesn't have faith in God. He commands his messenger and says to them, you're going to say to my Lord Esau. See, he's scared. He's scared. He didn't trust the Lord. He says, you're going to tell my Lord Esau, your servant Jacob says, I have a soldier and I've temporarily resided with Laban, our uncle, and I stayed there until now. Now I'm back. Verse 5. And I have oxen and asses, flocks and men servants and women servants. 
and I have sent to tell my Lord that I might, if, uh, if you have your cell phones, I'd like to ask if you can silence them, please. Okay, uh, so, oh, it's probably, is it some bell or something? Oh, wow, what a ring. That is pretty annoying. We need to change that bell, okay? <laughs> we need to change that sound. That is a very annoying bell, okay? <laughs> that was somebody's cell phone. All right, then. Uh, let's see, continually uh, reading onward. Uh, uh, where am I? Okay, uh, verse uh, 4, okay, verse 4. That was very distracting. Uh, he commands uh, them to tell his lord Esau that your servant Jacob... Okay, verse 5. And I have oxen and asses, flocks and men servants and women servants, and I have sent to tell my lord that I may find grace in thy sight. Jacob says, hey, I've got uh, oxen, I've got the donkeys, and then I have the flock of sheep, and uh, I also have male servants and then uh, women servants, and... I've sent to tell my Lord, so I've given the, all of them to you, and to tell you, Esau, my Lord, that I might find grace in your sight. Please don't be mad at me and kill me. Be gracious to me. That's the idea. He's trying to appease his wrath. Verse 6, so Jacob, that man, he is such a, ah, uh, this guy. He, the never-ending story of Jacob, his sinful nature. He continues on. He continues on his slick willy attitude. <laughs> In Genesis chapter 32 and verse 3, Jacob, when he realizes that Esau is on his way, he conjures up a plan. And his plan is, well, I'm going to have to prepare this huge gift so that I can appease Esau's wrath. Well, in verse 6, and the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to thy brother Esau, and also he cometh to meet thee, and 400 men with him. So the messengers return to Jacob, and they tell him, Hey, we went to your brother Esau, and he's coming to meet you, but he's bringing 400 men with him. So Jacob, in his mind, he is so scared in verse 7. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that was with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two bands. Now look at this crafty guy. He always went by his wits. I mean, he went by that way. Rachel went by that way. I mean, they just got a messed up family. All right, this is where the 12 tribes of Israel all come from, the Jews, right? Jacob, he was obviously really scared and he was distressed. So he divides the, all the people that's with him, and then including uh, the flocks and the herds into two bands, to two groups. Why would he do this? Verse 8, and said, if Esau come to the one company and smite it, then the other company which is left shall escape. So Jacob says, I'm going to have this one company that Esau's going to just, uh, if he comes over there, and then smites them and then kills them, then the other company behind that's left, they're, going, they're able to run away and escape. So the, the, he's going by a scheming mind. Now what happened to uh, the prophet of God right here? What happened to the prophet of God right here where isn't it a coincidence before we hit 3 and 8? What happened at 1 and 2? Yeah. Did you forget what happened at verse 1 and 2? 1 and 2, Jacob the prophet sees this armies of angels, not just one, but two armies, because of the name Mahanam. And Jacob, he should have been like Elisha, who had the power, who had the gift, to see all those armies of angels. But, oh man, what a prophet, man. Jacob, instead of realizing, hey, there's more for us than for them. Like Elisha said, Jacob's like, no, I'm so scared of this army of Esau. <laughs> After he saw God's armies, isn't that funny? Jacob's, he goes by his own plans again. Sneaky, sneaky, conniving Jacob. Never ends. Relying on his own wisdom. He never finishes it. Verse 9, 
And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which said unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. Oh, so now Jacob starts praying, okay? Notice that his tendency is to go by his plan first at three and five, right? He didn't pray. He went by his plan. I'm going to send this gift to appease Esau. But then it backfired at verse six. So you can imagine the Lord did that to scare him. Did I get your attention yet? Maybe you should start praying to me. So Jacob's like, all right, I'll pray. But before I pray, he does verse seven and eight. Then he prays. Now, as I've stressed over and over again, if there's from the last couple of chapters, one thing we can learn from uh, this uh, messed up family is never go by your own human wisdom. I mean, it's a stressful life. Now, your own way of doing things, can it be clever? Can it be smart? Sure. I mean, I read to you Genesis 30. That was an extremely clever plan. I never, uh, I mean, it was very clever. It's so clever that even today's PhD scholars don't know how to interpret that passage, actually. Jacob even baffled today's scientists. But see, that's what happens when you go, when you're so used to going by human wisdom, especially if it's so clever, it's an ingenious plan, you tend to rely and live that way rather than praying to the Lord. And when you live that way, it's a stressed out life. Don't try that. Don't try that, friend. It's uh, better that um, if you made some dumb mistakes, but you still relied on God and prayed to him, that's a le least stressful life compared to going by your own wisdom and I survived so far because of my wits. And Jacob, in his prayer at verse 9, he's, uh, he calls out to the God of his father Abraham and the God of his father Isaac. And he says, uh, the God that told me, hey, return home and to your family and I will take care of you. So Jacob is holding God to his word. Now, there are several important things. Genesis 32, believe it or not, believe it or not, this, is, this was probably one of the worst prophets examples that you'll ever see in the Bible, but this is one of the best prayers you'll ever see in the Bible as well. Jacob is a great example of prayer, a life of prayer. Now, maybe the Holy Spirit put a bad example like Jacob to encourage some bad examples of Christians in here. Now, probably your life is not right with God like Jacob. Perhaps you always went by your own terms, your own ways of doing things, like Jacob. However, Jacob's prayer even got God to answer it. God listened to his prayer. Now, this is one of those secrets to prayer lessons that you want to hear about. Genesis 32 is filled with that. If you want God to answer your prayer, even though you're a messed up individual, I'll tell you the secrets here. One is in verse 9, you have to hold God to his word. So the secrets to prayer are given here. So let's see, I will put prayer secret one because there is a treasure trove here. Is this cut off or no? no. Okay, let me know when it is. All right, I'll end it here. Prayer secret one is to hold God to his word. Now, if I've taught you that in previous studies, the most important thing, oh, hold God to his word, excuse me. It's to make sure to always use Bible verses when you pray to the Lord. George Mueller, he really held God to his word when he prayed, and he would point his finger at the passage and say, God, you said this in your word. So will you please answer it? So you hold God to his word. Prayer secret number two. Now, this should guarantee the answered prayer. Now, a lot of people don't think about this. There are people who say, well, I don't know uh, if God's going to answer, if it's God's will to answer this prayer or not. Well, I'll tell you one thing that should get him to answer, and it is his will. The simple thing is, in the word of God, you have to answer according to his will. Now, notice what Jacob said. It's your will that I go back home. So I can't be dead right now. So if I follow your will, you've got to answer it, God. 
See, so that's prayer secret too. A lot of times when we pray according to God's will, we feel like that, oh, then I don't, I don't know if God's going to answer it or not because I don't know if this request is according to his will, right? But, you know, that's, uh, that's true at times, but you forget to see this other side. If you do pray according to his will, there should be uh, confidence, not a lack of certainty. It should be the opposite. If your request is God's will and you know it, then it must be answered. So you follow God's will. You pray according to his will. And when I mean by according to his will, I also mean that uh, you follow his commands. If you follow his command, then God's going to have to answer it. You know why I knew that uh, as we prayed for God's protection on our church, that uh, we continue the ministry? You know why I knew that? Because God called me here. So I knew that we'd survive. I knew that we'd keep on going for the Lord. So that's why when we prayed for God's protection, we prayed that we'd continue the ministry. God had to do that because this is his work and we're following his will, not our own. Now, what can go wrong after that? These are really powerful prayer secrets. Verse 10, I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast shown unto thy servant. That's a very good prayer. Verse 10, Jacob says, I'm not uh, I am not worthy of your mercy. Now, mercy means uh, what you deserve, but you don't get it. So you deserve punishment, but you didn't get it. So Jacob, he's aiming for that mercy part. And then he's saying, I know that I deserve to be punished, and, and I don't deserve your mercy. But not just his mercy, he says the very least of all your mercies. He also says, I'm not even worthy of, this is a good one, you want to hear this one, of all the truth. He says, I don't even deserve to know uh, the truth, right doctrine. Why? Jacob could have just been as any of those secular humanists going by their own ways of doing things because Jacob lived like that. He didn't have to get Bible-believing truth. Now, this is important that I want some people to hear. Some people uh, have this assumption that if you uh, want the truth, that you'll get it and God will give it to you. That's true. Don't get me wrong. But you also have to realize this. If there's a person who really wants the truth, they're going to have to go by God's terms. Yep. Now, uh, everyone who, especially in this information age, everyone thinks they know everything and that they can find the truth and they're a truther or whatever. But you know what? These same so-called truthers are the ones that are wasting their lives and don't deserve the truth from God. And that's why God can mislead them. And even though they have the good intention, I want the truth. And you ever wonder why God never gives it to them? They don't deserve it. Why? Because let's say you get all the Bible-believing truth. Are you now going to go to a Bible-believing church or just keep sticking to this? Internet all, all the time. Yeah, that'll preach, amen. I'm parking it right here. We got a problem in this community. Too much knowledge, us Bible believers. You don't deserve the truth. You don't deserve dispensational truth. You don't deserve right doctrine. You don't deserve to know what's wrong with this wicked world so that you can stay away from the wicked world because you're not. You still dabble with the wicked world. That's a good prayer. That's my point <laughs> in verse 10. But see, we, uh, in, uh, when we pray to the Lord, our problem is we think we deserve it, don't we? So it must be answered. Can I repeat that again? The problem with your prayer is you think that you deserve it or you should have it. But to be honest, you don't. God doesn't, uh, uh, the point is, when you give this prayer request to uh, God, God don't need to answer it. God don't have to answer it. You got to realize that. 
So prayer secret number three is that admittance, that recognition. If you have this recognition and this confession, you confess it to the Lord of humility. If there's a, something of, a, I deserve this, or something like that in your heart, then God's not going to give it to you, all right? Confess your undeserving request. That's good. You really don't need God to answer that even though you feel like you need it. But when you have that attitude, the best thing to learn in life is the reason why we live in a very spoiled generation, yet at the same time a very depressed generation, and you wonder why so many people still commit suicide, is this. The tendency of people is we always think we deserve it or we need something more. If there was a mind to begin with, with I don't deserve the food that I eat, deserve the clothes that I have, the place that I live and stuff like that. There's more of a gratitude that easily comes out, more of a thanksgiving that easily comes out, and more of a contentment and even satisfaction. Now, that's one of the key secrets to happiness, which is why Buddhists get it wrong where you have to detach from all the uh, delights in life, right? Because they know that those delights in life when people get so caught up in that, it brings them greater depression because it keeps building up their expectation of, I need more, I need more, I deserve more. You have to draw a boundary line. Where's your boundary line? Of I'm satisfied, I'm done, right here. If you draw that boundary line, it will help you immensely in life. I found my joy to increase much more after that. So once I draw a boundary line, this is it, thank you, I'm satisfied, then I'm surprised how much more God gives me. So uh, it's not just important for your prayer life, it's important for your health, for your well-being. Okay, I hope you're learning a lot right here. Verse 10, notice... Uh, for with my staff, in verse 10, for with my staff, I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. Jacob, he tells God what's going on with him. He's opening up to him. Like, you know, with my staff, that's what people use when they carry on their journey. So that's what he means. So through this journey, I passed over the Jordan River, and now I am two different bands, two different groups. The next thing in prayer is your openness, your openness. Okay, so let's see. We went to verse 9 and then verse uh, 10. Okay, let me write the verses here too. And let me know if I'm cut off, okay? So verse 10b, uh, 10a, excuse me. Then we follow according to his will. That was 9A, uh, 9B. That was 9B. And then we saw 9A, where you hold God to his word. Now, this is very rich here. There's a lot you can learn. When pastors have talked about the secrets to prayer life, I've seen some jump to Genesis 32, several people going to Genesis 32. It is a treasure trove, actually. For a guy who's so wicked and uh, worldly, he sure knows how to pray. <laughs> that should give some hope to you, huh? That should give some hope to you. Can you imagine comparing, comparing Jacob to George Mueller? What, what a thing. <laughs> In verse uh, 10, he confesses openly. So God wants to hear your heart, all right? So you pour out your honest feelings, not to a psychologist, okay, to the Lord. You pour out your honest feelings to the Lord. Now notice that this is pretty good right here. Jacob, even though he's confessing uh, his feelings honestly, at the same time he realizes, I don't deserve the answer. So when you're pouring out your honest feelings, 
A lot of it could be a lot of hurt, a lot of pain, maybe even bitterness or some bad spirit in there. But at the same time, this should never leave your mind that, to be honest, you don't really deserve. You don't really deserve it. Okay? So it, you pour out openly to the Lord. God wants to hear it. God wants to hear it. Quite often I would uh, quote Hebrews 4 whenever I pour out my honest feelings to him and hold God to his word that this is what you promised for me to come boldly so that I can find grace. Well, Lord, uh, I don't seem to find grace right now. Will you give it to me? Okay. When you uh, continue reading onwards, in verse 11, Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. So notice this honest, open confession to God. He says, uh, please save me. I'm begging you. I'm praying to you from Esau's hand, from my brother's hand, because I'm scared of him. Otherwise, he's going to come and then he's going to kill me and even the mother with the children. Now, I find it interesting that he says singular mother with the children. So perhaps he still had that selfish nature in mind about Rachel, his wife. Or it could be a metaphorical phrase where he is referring to all the mothers, but it's just used in the singular term. So either or. Verse 12, And thou saidest, I will surely do thee good, and uh, make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Jacob holds God to his word again. He says, you said, I'm going to certainly uh, do good things for you. I'm going to make your children your offspring as numerous as the sand of the sea that cannot be numbered. So he quotes his word again. Now notice how often he quotes God's word. It's important within your prayer lines that uh, quite often there are those verses in between. That'll be good to use verses in between, not just at the beginning part or at the ending part, but even in between at times. It'll be good. Verse 13, and he lodged there that same night and took of that which came to his hand a present for Esau, his brother. So he uh, lodged there, so he stayed there for the night, and then he, uh, in his hand, whatever he had, he gave as a present to Esau, his brother. And this is what it is. Verse 14, 200 she-goats and 20 he-goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams. So that's self-explanatory, 200 female goats and then 20 male goats and then 200 female sheep and then also 20 rams, the male uh, sheep, so to speak. Verse 15, 30 milk camels with their colts, 40 kine and 10 bulls, 20 she-asses and 10 foals. All right, verse 15 is self-explanatory there as well. Verse 16, and he delivered them into the hand of his servants, every drove by themselves. Look at this clever scoundrel. All right, he's not done, okay? What? That flesh kicks in despite of a great prayer. All right, that flesh kicks in. Can I say this? You could be the greatest prayer warrior in this church, but you could be one of the most fleshly individuals. All right, let that be a lesson. All right, anyways, verse 16 points out right here. Uh, he gives all this list of flock and herd to the hand of his servants, so they'll take charge of it, but he makes sure it's every drove by themselves. So he's dividing it into different droves, and they're going to be by themselves. And said unto his servants, pass over before me and put a space betwixt drove and drove. So he's telling his servants, when you... You're going to pass over uh, ahead of me. Okay, you're going to pass over the river and go ahead of me. And you're going to make sure to put a space betwixt, uh, between drove and drove as they go on. Clever guy, man. <laughs> Verse 17, and he commanded the foremost, saying, When Esau, my brother, meeteth thee, and asketh thee, saying, Whose art thou? And whither goest thou? And whose are these before thee? So Jacob, he says, he commands the, the guys all the way at the front of the drove, okay? And says to them, hey, when Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, who are you guys and where are you going and what are these things uh, in front of you at your presence? 
Verse 18, then thou shalt say, they be thy servant Jacob's. It is a present sent unto my Lord Esau. And behold, also he is behind us. Okay, meaning in verse 18, Jacob says, then you're going to say to Esau when he asks you that, that all these belong to your servant Jacob's. It's a present sent for you, my Lord Esau. And also, uh, he's behind us. And so commanded he the second and the third and all that followed the droves, saying, on this manner shall he speak unto Esau when he find him. So he commands uh, also the second drove, so not just the first drove, he commands the second drove, the third drove, and all the other droves that are behind the third one, and says, you're going to say on this manner, you're going to say similarly this way uh, to Esau when you find him, when you encounter him. Verse 20, and say ye moreover, <laughs> so he's not done, he says, you're also going to say this. <laughs> now Jacob, notice, uh, he's going by his secular wits again. He, I mean, this guy, he's very smart. There's no doubt about it. Uh, with that fiasco he did with Laban, he says, in order to appease the anger of my brother Esau, and, you know, maybe if you husbands are fleshly, you could try this on your wife, right? You know, you send in a first drove of gifts. <laughs> and then she's like, I'm not satisfied. I'm still angry with you. Then some time, give it some time, then that second drove of gifts come by, a second surprise, you know? And the wife is a more touched, but she's still a little upset. Give it some time, then the third gift comes, and then the fourth, then all the other droves, and then all of a sudden, your wife just loves you to death, all right? And you don't have, and you can sleep in the same bedroom this time, not on the couch, okay? <laughs> Now, notice that this is highly recommended from a secular humanist standpoint. <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you what. I mean, uh, there's a lot to glean if you're a secular humanist here. There's a lot of things you can learn and glean from here. But notice, no matter how good the idea is, God's hand is not on it. As a matter of fact, when you read later on the chapter, it all was a waste of time. All was a waste of time. That's mankind's effort. All the best science that they pulled up, all the best ideas that they pulled up, the policies that they push, why does it keep failing? Why doesn't it ever work? Well, why don't you wake up, all right? Smell the coffee and surrender to God this time and realize nothing works without God. So verse 20, say ye moreover, so you're also going to say this, clever plan. Behold, thy servant Jacob is behind us, for he said, I will appease him, with the present that goeth before me, and afterward I will see his face, peradventure he will accept me. Now, why did Jacob say at verse 20, don't forget to say this part, behold, so behold is that word again, always used like paying attention to what I'm going to say this part here, that's the idea, your servant Jacob is behind us, your servant Jacob is behind us, it's like when you give that gift to appease the wrath of the individual, you want to make sure it's mentioned, love your husband in the name, right? Why? So that the person can be psychologically a little warped and calm down and be appeased that, oh, it's my husband that gave me that. My husband, my husband. And then supposedly your wife's feeling has been appeased now. If you... Uh, <laughs> Jacob is a very clever individual at verse 20 because it does work at times in a humanist way. When continuing onwards at verse 20, Jacob, he said, the middle part, when Jacob said, hey, uh, your servant Jacob's behind us, that's what you're going to tell my brother Esau. The reason he said that was, Jacob says to himself, I'm going to appease him with the present that's in front of me, all those gifts, and then after that, because I'm behind all those gifts, he's going to anticipate me, and then when he sees my face, possibly he's going to accept me after that. This guy worked hard, okay? He worked hard in his plan. Again, we saw at uh, verses, let's see right here, 13, through 20, uh, 13 through 20. 
in verses 13 through 20, Jacob goes by his plan and then a fleshly individual who, used to, who was a good prayer warrior resorts back to the secular ways of doing things. It's a bad habit. Now, some of you got bad habits. Whatever your bad habit is, I do know this, the tendency of bad habits is because you don't pray often or you're not used to the instinct of praying first before doing it. Didn't you know you can uh, even do all the secrets of prayer? Like Jacob. Listen, you can do all the secrets of prayer like Jacob. Get your prayer life right with God but you can still be the type of person who's not really a prayerful individual. You can pray hours long, you can pray all the secrets, but you're still not a prayerful individual. You might say, why? Because we see that with Jacob's case right here. Jacob, he had the tendency of not praying. We know that, right? Yet he knew all the secrets of prayer. He did all of the prayer stuff right. What, what's the key thing? The key thing is because the instinct is the bad habit, not prayer. So I don't care if you prayed so many hours or if you did all your, your prayer secrets, studied up George Mueller and all the prayer diaries and life and diary of David Brainerd or whatever, it won't matter. It won't matter a single thing if you always have the instinct of going to this, then prayer. That's good preaching right there, okay? Now, if there's one thing we learned in Genesis 32 is your prayer life. And I hope that your prayer life can change after that. All right, let's wrap things up. We'll look at verse 21. So went the present over before him and himself lodged that night in the company. So the verse is summarizing. So these uh, gifts went on in front of Jacob. They went on their way. Jacob himself, he stayed over the night with the company that he's with. Verse 22, and he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his 11 sons and passed over the ford Jabbok. So Jacob, he got up that night and then he took his two wives and then his two women servants and then his 11 sons and then he passed over the ford Jabbok. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. So he takes uh, the children and the women, and then he sends them over the brook, Jabuk, and then he also sent over the stuff that he had. So it's meaning his presence, his gifts. So he sends them along with them. Now, for some of you who don't know, if you look at verse 30, that's Peniel, right? That's where Jacob went. Now, look at what's going on here. Jacob, he goes to Peniel, and then... His wives and children, he sends them over the Ford Jabuk. But then when you continue onward at verse, chapter 33, verse 1, chapter 33, verse 1, how did he divide the group? So he had a bunch of presents up ahead of him. And then he has another backup plan where in verse 1, uh, when Esau's coming down, he divides the children in verse 1 with Leah then with Rachel and the two handmaids. So he had four other groups prepared. Four other groups prepared. Then in verse 2, he has the handmaids and the children at the front, Leah and the children behind, and Rachel and Joseph behind. Now, notice that Jacob, he's a wonderful father and a loving husband. He still picks favorites again. Notice Rachel and Joseph are the two special elites for him, and they have VIP seats. Then Leah's in front. See, he still mistreats Leah, okay? He still has that problem. And then he's got two handmaids over there, plus a whole bunch of other groupies with gifts in front of him. The selfish nature is still there. It's even worse because once you see that order, notice who's the one who's really behind. Jacob, but it's even more so when you read verse 22 and uh, 
30, like I mentioned before. Because when he sends him over the brook Jabbok and he's at Peniel, supposedly he's going, uh, he's going more behind the group and the wives are up ahead. <laughs> Such a coward, man. Because uh, in verse 23, uh, what makes me see it that way is in 22, when he sends over the wife and children uh, ahead of him, verse 23, he sends the gifts over there too. Why? That's deliberately done to appease the wrath. Okay, wow, what a guy, man. What an individual. But uh, sadly, not much different than us. And even if you've done so much praying, it don't matter a hill of beans, to be honest. You're still not a prayerful individual. Heavenly Father, I pray that tonight, uh, today's teaching was a blessing to the hearers that we've learned so much and that uh, it will transform our prayer life and we'll live a life that will please you and we'll be prayerful individuals, not just uh, using prayer tips and secrets individuals. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.